Hi, this is Velma Bland. I am going to um, go over race and research, research and race. It is a, a methodological dilemmas in critical race studies. In critical race studies, um, we speak about the crisis involving ethnicities, different ethnicities in different lands and countries, people of color. Um, the different dilemmas that take place of which the behaviors or the customs or the um, the way someone way of life you know their their way of upbringing their backgrounds and and it's all a part of a way of life how we intend on dealing with other people in the environment and, and what our preferences are and how we deal with these crises that um, we may end up experiencing trauma events from. So race and research, research and race. I, um, I wrote a book review, um, the guidance of Dr. Jason Jake Campbell at Nova Southeastern University. And this is the book that I chose to review. And um, it was over 6,000 pages and there were different scenarios, different dilemmas, as it says, methodological dilemmas. And we have a total of, um, let's see, the chapters, if I can remember, is about nine. Let me check it again. <clears throat> 10 chapters. So what I, what I want to do is to um, go over the acknowledgments and four words of Troy Duster. We also have different authors throughout each chapter. Um, France with its twine is chapter one. Nahid Islam, chapter two. Charles A. Gallagher, chapter three. Kathleen M. Blee, chapter four. Lorraine Delia Kinney, chapter five. Jonathan W. Warren, chapter six. Michael G. Hancard, chapter seven. Felipe uh, Bourgeau, chapter eight. Mitchell Donier, chapter nine. And chapter 10, Kamkam Biav Nani and Angela Y. Davis. Of course, we know Angela Y. Davis was a civil rights um, activist, professor, and, um, and there were quite a few um, notations where she's written here in that chapter, explaining her dilemma she experienced in the prison when she served time for um, allegedly being involved in murdering a judge, as, as I recall it was. So we'll get to that. But what I'm going to do is, what I'm going to do, or what I would like to do, and what my goal is, is to go through this book and to commentate it via video and to just, you know, just like I walk through all of my other material and to give it full meaning from the from reading the literature. Okay, so we have first the acknowledgments for Troy Duster. <clears throat> we thank the contributors to this volume for patiently working with us during the past years. We are very grateful to our editor, Nico the fund whose enthusiasm, encouragement, and belief in this project brought it to completion. And during the editorial process, Despina Papa Zoglu Gimbel handled this manuscript with skill and grace. We have been sustained intellectually, politically, and emotionally by friends and colleagues, old and new. Richard Applebaum, Ingrid Banks, Tani Barlow, Vilna Bashi, Howard S. Becker, Carla Simone, Barbosa de Brito, Kamkam Beavnani, William T. Bilby, Denise Bilby, Kathleen Blee, Felipe Borjo, Karen Brodkin, Jacqueline Nasi Brown, Dave Carson, Hector Carrilla, Donna Martin Carter, Nalista Cuffey, William Darati Jr., Angela Y. Davis, Mitchell Donier, Troy Duster, Steve Epstein, Richard Flax, 
John Foron, Ruth Frankenberg, Maria Franklin, Charles Gallagher, Pam Goldman, Lauren E. Goodlad, Avery Gordon, Antonio Sergio Alfredo Gumarayes, Theo Gorsky, Gail Hanlon, Michael Han Chord, Hella Haydorn, Arnell Hinkle, Judith Howard, Nahid Islam, Lucy Jaraz, Alan Jenkins, Lorraine Delia Kenny, Ellen Lewin, Donna Lowe, Kristen Luker, Jelani Mahari, Irma McLaurin, Deidre McDonald, Heather Merrill Carter, Kenneth Mostern, Ruth Mostern, Pedro Antonio Nogrera, Jody O'Brien, Constance Penley, Sabrina Laramet, Dara Robinson, Beth Schneider, Carolyn Morton Shaw, Nikhil Pal Singh, Stephen Small, Matthew Spork, Becky Thompson, Mamie Lewis Twine, Ron Ware, Alice Weinbaum, Brackett F. Williams, Ara Wilson, Howard Winant, John Wolf, Joe Wood, Rahan Zamil, and Abebe Zegaya. We are deeply appreciative of two extraordinary institutions, the University of Washington, Seattle, and the University of California, Santa Barbara, both of which provided numerous forms of institutional support that enabled this project to be brought to completion. <clears throat> The Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington, Seattle, and the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, allowed one of us, Twine, to rearrange her teaching schedule so as to facilitate the completion of this book. Our colleagues at these institutions provided inspiration, encouragement, and other forms of support. And Seattle, we are especially grateful for the support of Jerry Bacharach, Joel Migdal, Risat Kasaba, Victoria Lawson, and Cynthia Steele. And Santa Barbara, we received emotional, administrative, and moral support from Chris Allen, Richard Applebaum, William T. Biobe, Ed Donnerstein, Avery Gordon, Claudine Michelle, John Moer, Harvey Molach, Constance Penley, Cedric Robinson, Elizabeth Robinson, Beth Schneider, and Nancy Will Statter. Grateful acknowledgement is made to Cambridge University Press for permission to reprint a revised version of Felipe Bourgeau violating apartheid in the United States. From In Search of Respect, Selling Crack and L. Barrio, copyright 1995 by Cambridge University Press. It appears as chapter eight of this book. So France Winnett's Twine and Jonathan W. Warren edited, they ed edited by France Winnett's Twine and Jonathan W. Warren, Seattle, Washington, June, 1999. <clears throat> now, as I begin, um, what I wanna say is that with so many different races and so many different experiences, as many of us recall many centuries ago about the African Africans were brought over in the slave trade. And um, then once we were colonized and we developed and, and we were given rights here in America as equal rights to all other nationalities here, there are some people of color who did arrive in the United States and President Lincoln, once he freed the slaves, um, he did offer a large, vast amount of Africans who were mostly from Morocco and West Africa an opportunity to leave the United States so that they would be able to find happiness because he informed a crowd of them, over 5,000, that they would never be happy in America because the middle class white men were not really ready to let them go out into society to be free 
and independent. And, and thus he did, um, thus President Lincoln at the time did give the black people who decided to stay in America union territories whereby they would loader or hang there and to help arrive, you know, because now they're endangering their lives hanging around because of the Jim Crow lynch law were passed. And um, we did have black lawyers at the time and professional black people that were not in sweaty and they were in the North. And many black women who were advocates and civil rights leaders and, and um, who um, were there to support the black men and black boys who were being detained and snatched and abducted and taken until the night after long hours of work in the fields after they were free and lynched them anyways, you know, out of hate and malice. But anyways, many, um, back to what, where I was headed, um, many of the Africans who were brought here were offered an opportunity to freedoms away from the United States, away from the states is how they described it then. And they were taken, uh, there were two boats waiting, I believe it was. I, 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 I remember reading the literature and I'm having a hard time finding it again because I posted it on Facebook to share with all who um, does read, you know, what I post on Facebook, that um, 5,000 or more Africans were given the opportunity to leave the states and to, they were, because there, there is no guarantee, there was not any guarantee, according to President Lincoln, that the Africans that were freed slaves, they were colored, called colors then, would ever be happy. Thus, they were free because the Jim Crow lynch law has some loopholes in it that, um, that um, black men, they were free men for as long as they didn't commit a crime. So there was a lot of crimes set up in um, subjecting these black freedmen that were given the Confiscation Act and were told to, um, later on in history, to educate themselves once they did go through many of the Jim Crow lynch attacks and everything, um, to educate themselves, become pastors, business owners, and or to educate themselves and to become powerful community advocates or to give back to society. And and this was the Confiscation Act of 1862. So we so then most of the people who did board the ship to sail over to the Hispaniola Islands that were now today are considered islands of Jamaica and Cuba and Puerto Rico. And then you have the Grenadines going down because many of the slave ships um, left West Africa and, and headed directly, sailed directly because the storms always bring the same sailing destination. The storms always come from the West Africa straight over to us, straight over to Florida or straight over to Haiti or straight over to Grenada. The, the same ships that traveled, the explorers that traveled over exploring the continents and different places around the world, these great um, soldiers were, were captains and admirals and generals had owned slaves and they brought them over here. And the first place they um, did stop was Grenada. And there was another time Cuba and there was another time Bahamas and then finally Jamestown, uh, Virginia. So they got on the, the, many of the people who did not want to risk their lives of um, being captured by mobs who were very, very, um, they were terrorizing many of the black homes in the night and setting them afire and with the white sheets and everything because of white supremacy and nationalism in 1920s. So many of this, after the slaves was freed, after President Lincoln had given these people of color who were colored people then, a Negroes, the opportunity to board the ship to, to send them to a safe haven, which were islands, but then they would not be able to reach land again in America. And they could not cross over the borders without um, some sort of pass. So whatever they had given them down, we now call it immigration, naturalization services, or Homeland Security has now taken that over since the 9-11 attacks. So 2003, somewhere around there. So what we have here is 
These are the people who are now Jamaicans, Cubans, Grenadians, and of which some are Hayden, Haitians. And Puerto Rico is now a uh, U.S. Um, a part of the U.S. United States and Alaska and Hawaii. So um, now, what we have now is where are the archives? Where? What happened to? this documentary because I did read it and I can't find it anymore. Because we have Jamaicans, we have people who were sent to the islands where rightfully their descendants were rightfully U.S. citizens already. They were already U.S. citizens. But because they boarded that ship, they have no proof that they were already U.S. citizens. But who were they? What were the names documented on that boat? Because every time a slave traveled, on the boat from one destination to another, there were archives where everyone were logged down. It was a, 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 a black woman, and something. Sometimes they documented it as a winch, and and you know the way how the language had been, the, the language were back then, the language had um some derogatory dialects. The dialogue was a little derogatory, but. It was a language back then, winch, black winch owned by uh, Montgomery, blah, 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 or Admiral, General, uh, Seoul. And, and, and I did see the archive. I found it from Grenada, Caribbean, because my, my former husband, who's passed on now, um, I found the archive from the Grenada, West Indies, history, historical um, statistical index. And I posted on Facebook, and I kind of felt like, you know, I felt a tension, you know, like over the internet, I felt tension as if people just didn't like the fact I posted it, so I took it down. But it was very important information and I can't find it anymore. So if anyone found it or anyone saved it, please post it again on Facebook because there's a lot of people, names are listed on there and they don't know where they actually come from. But anyways, we have the Morocco's or um, West Africa with some really, um, strong mandingos and they were barbarians and carnivores and i mean flesh eating and 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 they would fight back and and um the white americans had problems with them so they were one of the first that boarded the ship to go to to leave america from away from the terror of the clans to reach an island and 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 most of them ended up in jamaica so it's one of the reasons you find um, the J Jamaican nationalities, the men are very strong and they're very, they're into, um, what is this religion, the Jehovah God, or if they're not doing Jehovah God, they're Rastafara, you know, they're, they're Muslims or something like that. But um, it's one of the reasons why the Jamaicans, um, you find that if you cross them, that they're um, the type of people, um, might give you some some problems. They won't back down easily because their 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 um, descendants are from Morocco, Africa, which is the worst part. That's up there near the Congo, where King Leopold II came in there and slaughtered ten million blacks, uh, um, Africans, and, and maimed them, cut off the left leg and cut off the right arm, and 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 made them uh, disabled so that they wouldn't be able to run away and leave that area. And he came back. It was all for the love of rubber. It was all for the love of rubber. Now, we, I think I have just some little snippets of that scenario here. There is some snippets of that scenario in here. But the way the author writes is he writes in a conventional fashion. Therefore, a person that does not read a lot, that may not understand the literature as an elitist um writing fashion would not catch it so as i run into it i will share it with you so um <clears throat> the beginning it starts on page well this is um it has a roman number so it's 10 11 like 10 it's 11 but it's not a page it's a roman number page one is two pages over where it starts is on the campus of the university of california santa barbara a predominantly white campus. A student raised her hand in class and asked, why is it that when eight white students are having lunch at the cafeteria, 
We see this as just eight students having lunch, but when eight black students have lunch, it is called a balkanized racial enclave, right? So it's like, it's a big deal, you know, it's a big crisis. And that's what this is about, is critical race studies. Now, that question was a responsible question because this student notices she's a predominantly, uh, she attends a student, she attends a predominantly white uh, college. <clears throat> so her question to the teacher was, why is it that when white students sit down and have lunch together, it's not any fuss about it, but when black students sit, sit together, it's a balkanized racial enclave. And what they're saying is they're planning a, planning a crime. <clears throat> when you see large groups of blacks in one place, the police get nervous, you get to passing by your neighborhood and checking things out because black people are powerful. Their skin is, 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 is outstanding. You know, it stands out, especially when you have black and browns together and they're all sitting down talking when it's, it's outside of the norm. It's outside of the norm. So it's considered a balkanized, racial, radical enclave because they're perhaps thinking that these um, black students have a lunch together, eight of them in their group together are planning some crime. And, and it's something that we call as identified as stereotypes. Their stereotypes believe that these students that attend college because they're all black sitting in a group together, just like all Spanish sitting in a group together, all Chinese, all white sitting in a group together. Why can't black sit in a group together without you believing that it's some radical balkanized enclave, some plan to start a school riot? Excuse me. All right, so. Part of the answer lies in the context, in the numbers and the demographic at a predominantly white campus, black standout, just like I just said. But that is only part of the answer. Why are black students having lunch together has now become a research question. <laughs> and Beverly Tatum's 1997, I don't know if she's related to the star, what is her name, Tatum? Um, not Tatum Star. I don't. I, I remember the father is an actor. Anyways, um, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria? She turned it into a research. I can't believe it. So therefore, just as the student question says, why is it when eight stu black students sit together in the lunchroom together in a crowd in a group, just the same as all other nationalities why is it that the black students are considered balkanized racial enclave like some they plan to some crisis some riot or something and so beverly tatum in 1997 that was a research study for her okay why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria is the topic and it addresses a concern that does not even surface for serious inquiry for whites Okay, but it does for blacks. The reason cannot be answered by reference to demo, uh, demography alone. It cannot because our demographic is, is our population. We all have our different neighborhoods as inner cities, as in the minority area locations, populations, low income, minimum wage. And then we have our suburbs, which are middle class. And then we have the elitists live within the suburbs, but maybe up on the hill a little bit, and they have big gates you can't come through there. You can't come through there without security stopping you before you get through. <clears throat> the reason cannot be answered by reference to dem demography alone. Issues of stratification and political power intersect with demography and shape the very domain of inquiry that social scientists normally engage or don't engage inside their disciplinary borders. So therefore, the issues arise are strategies, and it's, it has to do with political power, which intersect with, that shapes society, and it shapes the very domain of inquiry, which is the questions of whys, which are interrogative questions, 
Why did Beverly Tatum interrogate this as a problem to write a research paper on? That's like an interrogation. But, but another reason is because maybe she's white and she doesn't know what black people. And maybe she was raised up to believe that black people sitting around them eating lunch, uh, that there could be a problem and then they may get, get to shooting and killing people. Some people are raising their children to be afraid of, of black people or people of color. And whether or not they believe it, we feel the same way about the whites. When you're looking and staring at us, we get scared too. What you gonna do to us? So it's, it works both ways. But it, it's called cultural avoidance. It's when you do not want to see us happy in a large group sitting down together, eating lunch, laughing and enjoying ourselves. Black people are not supposed to be happy, America. Is that what you're saying to us? Because if she brings a paper out, a research paper to an extreme level of, of interrogation is why are black students having lunch together? It become a research question. Sitting together in the cafeteria is because they're eating lunch. They're on break. They're, they're on break from school. They're eating lunch. That's why there could be brothers and sisters or cousins and brothers and sisters mixed with neighbors and family down the street and they all come to cottage together on the same bus. That's why they're friends. There could be cousins and sisters and brothers sitting there together. It has nothing to do with their planning to, to riot the place at the school. But that's a simple question. That's a simple answer for me. I can answer the question without any problems because I'm a black person. I'm a person of color. I'm brown. But I, I check off black African-American on my applications if I got to fill out something. Thus, I am Native American. I check black because of my skin color. I'm red and I'm tan and I'm brown. So when white people stand next to me, they're looking at me and they're looking at me from head to toe and they're looking at my skin because my skin is natural tan and they can see I'm mixed. But I'm not going to go through all, all that. You know, it, it's just a long story. But I'm just saying uh, they know. Most of, our, most of us are black people according to the skin, but we're white on the inside. We're white people with black skin, and they don't even know. It. And it's true. Many, of, many black people, this color here is my blouse here, and they're white. Because a mother white, but they came out black like the daddy that's from Africa or from the Bahamas or from Haiti. So it, it's like a research question. Why? Because there were family members, friends, or neighbors that for years, since they were little kids going to kindergarten, used to sit down and eat lunch together at school. So now they're on campus, they're in college, and they're trying to educate themselves. And that's why, Beverly Tatum, all these black kids are sitting together at the desk, at the table, eating lunch next to all you white people and the rest of your races. So that's the reasons why I thought racism, American experience that was taught by Dr. Jason J. Campbell, at Nova Southeastern University was very and a very important course of study for me because I grew up during the time when we were leaving segregation and going into the integrative approach to integrate all of the predominantly white and predominantly black schools to, so we can get to know each other better, so we can stop all these conflicts and police brutality and all these things that was going on of which the white people, white police officers had um, many, many claims of them brutalizing and beating and killing black men. Solely to just get them to, to, to follow order, they had to choke them to death. You know, or the night six didn't work, so we would choke them to death, or we'll shoot you and say you had a, had, had a knife in your hand. But, um, you know, I think that this book here educates people of color, the people like me, to understand that we still got some people out there are raised and their parents are not telling them the truth about people of color. You don't need to be afraid of us when you see us coming up the street. You don't need to worry about anybody attacking you. Now, if you see someone come up the street and they look threatening, then yes, you have all right to protect yourself. But you don't have to worry about Velma Bland. I'm not an aggressor. I am the person that's always having to, to, to defend myself. And I am the person that's always need to keep my mouth closed 
so that I won't make a lot of enemies. But then you need to understand that I'm very direct. I do not bite my tongue. To hide who I truly am. To despite my face. To save face. Because I, I'm not going to sit there and let anybody harass me and tolerate that. Because now we're in a, a different era now. Slavery days are over. Um, we are now living in 2014. We're, you know, the 21st century is when you reach past 2050. Because now we're over on a new level. We're on a new Mayaya Pond or whatever they say. Right now we're switching over to a new world. But this became a research question. It did. It, 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 it drew a lot of, of, of anger of many blacks that read this book. I didn't get mad, but I was like, really? I think that research question is too narrow, Beverly Tatum. But you seem to have gotten through that research question in that paper. Now, uh, move it along. Indeed, in addition to the question of how do we study race, this collection of essays also addresses a more historically been the study of people of color. Okay? Who has race? People of color. White people are uh, uh, Caucasian or American to be more formal. They're not considered ethnic groups. They are homogeneous. According to Dr. Jason J. Campbell, he taught this topic. Homogeneous is white dominant groups. But wait a minute. I never had a chance to say that to Dr. Campbell because I didn't want to interrupt his class because he was in in, in debt, you know, into this he was like really into it clicking, right? Blacks are dominant as well, Dr. Jason J. Campbell. But we are powerless. You see what I mean? Like we have a white dominant and we have a black dominant, but who are the weakest link? Blacks, because blacks allowed themselves to be the weakest link. They didn't fight like the French and Indian War and the American Indian War. And they didn't fight back. They, they believed in prayer and the Bible and things like that. And they wanted to, to and they didn't understand. They couldn't communicate because they were, these were not then called blacks. They were Africans from Europe over on the other side of the ocean on the east. They didn't understand the language. And they were always uh, uh, modest people and uh, people who were conditional, who, who followed instructions and and and, and they um, experienced a lot of battery and, and, and chains and, and some jumped out of the boat and killed themselves before they wanted, didn't want to see what was going to happen because the black flag rise up with the crossbones up there. But when you came through to pick them up, you said you was a Jesus ship. Okay, so that's how you got them on that boat. And then we have uh, Queen Elizabeth, if her name was Queen Elizabeth. She, in fact, she was a Spanish. The Sp Spain owned the, the slaves in 1500s, 1600s. There was a young Spanish, um, I think she was no more than 13 years old. And they had to answer to her because all her parents were murdered and everything, right? Spain was the richest place. Africa was once rich. Spain had a lot of money back then. You know, luxury, imperial royalty. Spain owned slaves. American Indians owned slaves. They sure did. It's one of the reasons why people like me are mixed up with American Indians on slaves. And they breed it with African Americans. So did Leopold and so did many of the others far back in, in historical perspectives. As several contributors to this volume note for research purposes, Whites do not have race. You see what I mean? Whites do not have race. They are pure. 
They do not have any pigmentation, no race. And they're lacking me me um, mel melanin, which is in the brain. Okay? Only blacks have melanin. And that's why many of the blacks <clears throat> were studied a lot. And how do they find out about it? It's the lack of melanin. That's why whites burn when they go out to tan. Um, they can't stay out in the sun very long because the skin is has a thin, the sebaceous glands are very thin. You got the sub, uh, uh, subcutaneous and you have the sebaceous. So let me just look it up. Melanin is... It 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 is a, like melanoma. It's like your 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 pigmentation of your skin. Well, it's formulated near the cranium process in your brain. Well, many of the Vietnamese wars during the Vietnam War, when the soldiers were brought home, those who uh, demise in the war, they were murdered or uh, tragics, died in the war. You have your white soldier here died and the black soldier well you know when they do the autopsy and everything um it was discovered then that black men has melanin and white men doesn't and that's why one of the reasons why black skins skin we have something that they don't have meaning the reason why they can't tan in the sun they can tan but they will burn when they go out in the sun you know, they get the nice tan, golden tan, beautiful tan. But you can't stay out there long because you're going to turn red and it's going to peel you, right? Your nose peel. Because whites doesn't have, whites are not a race. They do not have pigmentation. And whites are unidentifiable, according to Dr. Jason J. Campbell lectures. Um, whites were not able to identify who they really was, where they came from. They were just white people. And so what they did is they, um, uh, the hybridism is when we come together with other ethnic groups, because as I did mention in my book notes, and my book notes are missing here in my house. Sometimes my friend borrowed my material and he bring it back and I didn't give, I didn't give him permission. So I'm, I hope he brings it back because I'm missing the book notes. But I do have the document, but I'm missing some, like somebody accidentally erased something or took something out of there. And I suspect somebody's messing around with my material through hackers. So that my computer was hacked. But um, the Irish, the Serbians, S-E-R-B-I-N, the Irish or the Serbians, um, mixed with blacks. And you will find that it, it, the Irish have kind of round nose, nose kind of like round, piggish, like black's nose, kind of round, piggish, right? You see some of them nose like that, and some of them jaw are like blacks. It is written in my documentary of my material that because the Irish breed it with Africans, and the profound European nose. Those are our white Americans who are European at the profound London, the nose, right? So blacks, her nose, my father had, when he was alive, his nose and my grandfather's nose was like profound, like white American nose. So some of us, our nose are like this. Some of us, our nose, you know, it's just round. You can see it probably had somebody in the family if you see my nose, you know somebody in the family had a pointed nose and somebody in the family had a flat nose. And my mother had the flat nose. It wasn't flat, but it was like, it, was, it wasn't like my dad's nose, which was straight and prominent as white Americans. So we have here, blacks are mixed with Irish and they don't even know it. But there's another article that was missing out of my, my stack of papers. Hold on just a minute. Okay, I don't want to start a controversy, but it's, it's, it's in the writings. If you just um, look up um, Irish, Serbian, Irish, and colored people. 
Okay, you will find it. It's just going and searching in articles and you'll find it. So what we have here is people who are in denial of their own decent, their own phenotypes. They don't understand where they come from and and, and so whites did not know where, who they really were. They're considered the unknown because they do not have a color. But when you take the black, the black people considered as in at that time, back then, before they found out who they really were. Because as we look back in history, we got Russia, we have China, and uh, we have China. Chinese came over here and breeded with the blacks too in America or breeded with the Africans. We got India who, who are blacks, who are right next door to China. Okay, so we have China who are yellow skin and we have the Indians with dark skin. They're right next door to each other. Vietnam, Vietnam, Viet Cong, all those places are right there. So with all the soldiers and everything, um, U.S. soldiers, black soldiers, white soldiers, they breeded enough children over there. You know, in, in Vietnam, and Viet Cong, and different places, Saigon. They left plenty of babies over there. So it's the same way, I mean, as the travelers, the travelers going from the soldiers are everywhere, leaving babies everywhere. Black soldiers, white soldiers, Chinese soldiers, Japanese, leaving babies, black babies, white babies everywhere. And so we have a mixture and ethnicity of people, subgroups, multinationals, subnationals, multiculturals. And it's because we are travelers and we make love to people and we leave babies behind. So for many years, several of my white colleagues in sociology have complained to me about what they have seen as an unfortunate tendency for black, Latino, Asian American, and Native American students to do what is characterized as mere autobiographical sociology, mere autobiographical sociology is your own narrative, your own story about your own self, and it's your own lifestyle in society. So we have the American and Native American students to do what is characterized as mere autobiographical sociology. And we have the Black, Latino, Asian American, and Native American students who attended the University of California. And I, I visited California for two weeks. I ended up in San Francisco because there was a, a big jazz thing going there. I was in this traveling group selling magazines door to door, and there were many blacks mixed with Hawaiians and blacks mixed with, I don't know if they were Japan, Japanese, but you remember Hiroshima, we had the World War II in Hawaii. So there's many Japanese blacks in California. Many, 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 many of them. Beautiful people. They are referring to the fact that many students of Asian ancestry want to study problems of Asian Americans or that African American students tend to study African American issues. So we're all drawn to study the, the controversies and issues of our own ethnic group. But when we're mistreated by whites or by any other race or mistreated by blacks, because we do have blacks doing some things too, so you're not squeaky clean then we want to study you because why are all these black students sitting up in the cafeteria together? We've never seen that before at this university at California. What's going on? So now they're concerned because it's something new that they had never seen before. And so now it's a research study for Tatum. One of these colleagues pronounced with some passion that he would never want to study his own group because he was afraid of the implicit bias he, you know, he was afraid that he might um, receive some criticism and that he may say, say the wrong thing and, and may um, end up getting criticized and may cause, you know, some, some problems that will reflect on him to be into some issues or a fight or something like that. What is remarkable is that his white students were routinely studying the lives of white Americans with no consciousness, no reflexivity, and little awareness that race was a feature of their studies as well. So what they're saying is that the white students, they studied, their study was about th themselves 
and they didn't show any signs of guilt for only thinking about their own roots or their own culture, okay? And when we say roots is your own, your background, where you come from, your family tree, that's your roots. It's your father, your father's father, his father's father. Your roots are your father, your surname, your grandfather, great grand, great 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 great. That's your roots, because all the children are born from the paternal side of the family. The father blood it, it, it is um, uh, um, blood and serum mixed together from the sperm. When the mother conceive, that DNA is going to come from the father. But we we can we can do tests a maternal test to see if that child um, belongs to the mother too. There's a way they can do tests within. Um, when we talk about roots, we're talking about where your father came from, where his father came from, where the father, 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 surname, that your family's name. This collection is all about bringing to the surface for examination and review and analysis what it means to be conscious of race when one is doing research. What it means to be conscious of race is, you know, you want to be conscious that some people do not want to talk about their race. Some people do not want to discuss. They don't, some people do not even know. Some blacks does not even know where they come from. They don't care and they don't really want to know. You know, they're saying, I'm not African. I'm African American, I'm black. But as Judge Tolbert said, black is culture. And I have to agree with her. It's just a culture group of people who chose black. They were rather black than to be called African American. No, I'm African American and I'm mixed with native. I'm a native American, I'm mixed with Indian, native American. But I choose African American to just make it, to keep it from being too broad mixed with white, mixed with this, mixed with that, or mixed with this, and mixed with this, that. Just to keep it from being too broad, because we know what we are. But that's one of the reasons why people of color do not like to discuss race. Because they feel a little uncomfortable. That, you know, because it it, it, it was a de derogatory um, race, black race, were, were considered, where blacks were treated and called the n-word you know nigerians instead of being called nigerians they were called niggers and we have association groups now who they call each other you know you're my nigger because that's that's just you know my nigger you know it is it's, it's nothing to hurt anyone's feeling it's just a, a form of speech it's how they identify each other as my my buddy, my partner, my buddy, my posse. You know, they say my nigga, but they say my posse. That's what they're really saying. For those of you who do not understand, if you hear black saying nigga this, nigga this, oh nigga shut up, oh nigga this, but it's they're saying you know my buddy, my posse, my my dog. So once you learn the language. Once whites learn the language of blacks, we don't need to have a big discrimination lawsuit because somebody calls somebody a nigger unless they term the terminology of being called a nigger was you black nigger. Now it's a lawsuit because a white person said it or because some, a supervisor said it in front of the whole entire division. They get, I'm going to fire that black nigger today. So we have a lot of things that people experience. And remember I told you I'm very direct. I'm very direct. I don't bite my tongue. To despise who I really am. Or to disguise who I really am. It has happened before. It has happened. And then we get black people and they're scared to sign the Ethnics Commission form because they don't want to get fired. So you're on your own if you try to report that someone called you a name like that and a supervisor did something to you that was derogatory. So it's one of the reasons why you will find that some people, what it means to, 
They're conscious of race. They don't want to talk about it. It just makes them, you know, get the willies. They want to change the topic. Conscious of race when one is doing research. Okay, the collection is all about bringing to the surface for examination, review this information and analyze it, what it means to be conscious of race. Is you first need to know what is race. Describe it. You know, it's a creed, it's, it's, it's a part of a person's bloodstream, their blood, their background, their, where they come from, their, their family, their roots, you know what I mean? The roots is your race, where you come from. What are your phenotype? What are your blood type? What are you made of? What do you consist of? When one is doing research, you must know what is race first. Describe race. Give me a sentence about race. Why are you studying race? What happened to make you want to dig a little deeper into this topic? You know, do you have any other material? You know, what happened? It's that what happened is somebody is curious why eight black students were sitting at the lunch table in the cafeteria and they're not mixing up with everybody else. But you didn't mix with everybody else. You got a bunch of whites in one group over here. You got Hispanics over here. We got Asians over here. We got Indians in from India, Indians over there. And we got blacks over here, whites over there. Everybody separated. Now, what we have here is people are eating lunch together and they work in this department together. And maybe their friends who may were white some of them were white, or some of them were different culture groups. Went out, went home to eat lunch, and they just happened to day didn't sit down without group to eat lunch. It could be that too, but it, it's not rocket science. Why you see eight black students sitting down eating lunch together? It's lunch hour. That's why. And I plan to, to bomb up the school and, and cause any school violence. But see, when we have somebody thinking and narrow-minded like that. And you want to go do a research paper. And I think it's narrow-minded, Beverly Tatum. It's a good book. She's just an author in a particular section. We've got plenty more to talk about. We're going to go through this book. So since somebody took all my my um my book notes from my house. And then stole it or did something. I don't know who did it. But now I need to be careful who's in my, who's coming in my house. Because I got too much material in here. Now I got to get file cabinets and lock up all my university materials. But this is to confuse the biologic, the bi, the biological with the social. Okay, there are those who argue that just to acknowledge race is to perpetuate the biological myth of race, like I just described. But this is to confuse the biological with the social. And the biological is your your bio, your your biological parents, mother, father. Analytically, there are two quite distinct issues in the study of race. One is methodological matter, who has access to what's seen and with what outcome? Who has who has access to what's seen? And and and, and with what outcome okay i can't get i can't get into your gate of the elite system because it's locked up we got to go through security they're going to interrogate me i can't come in but the ghetto anybody can drive through here flat the tires break your windows yell out yo ho when you're walking up the sidewalk and you're just walking your dog in a pair of shorts that's, that's your inner city. You deal with so many different crazy things. You know, people's minds are... And sometimes their mind are overlapping into a crisis when there really is not a crisis. It's just their paranoid schizophrenia and, and they don't see the next person as equal or they're worried about the next person because maybe they're negative themselves. If you are not fully confident in your own self and where you are in society, why go over there? 
I am not going to go in a neighborhood where I'm not wanted. If, I, if I'm invited somewhere and I come to your home and you treat me like I'm a piece of crap, I'm not coming back again. Or if I'm over here and I'm invited and everybody knew I was coming and they act like you don't know me when we grew up together and we're family, I'm not coming back. It's because I know who I'm, my bi biological makeup is no different than yours or my parents and your parents or siblings or we cousins or your cousins or not my cousins. We are in-laws. So we're not close to your cousins on that side of the family, but you and I are first cousins, but I'm not close to your cousins. And you're not close to my cousins because partly I don't even know all my cousins. I don't really have a lot of cousins, but I'm just saying that when we discuss in race, why perpetuate it to become a biological myth of your race? We are family members or we are sisters and brothers, but we have a different mother or we have a different father, but we were came out of the same womb. So we are perpetuating the biological myth of our own family members. And it's an argument all the time. But who started it? Our parents caused all that trouble, did they? No, they made love or they got married and had family and some of us are just don't like each other because we look at each other and, you know, we smile and everything, but at the funeral, everybody crying and everybody hugging each other. So I'm confused about that. When somebody dying, we're crying and we're hugging each other. But when that person was alive, why didn't you say I love you and I miss you? Um, I'm sorry, you know, that I haven't been nice to you or I apologize if I harm you in any way or if I hurt you anyway. I want you know to, to please come. I'm having a party. That's how we open up to problems that were there that never resolved. So when we perpetuate the biological myth of a race, um, it is intentionally to confuse the biological with the social. Because the social world is your social world can become my social world if I was invited to, to be in your social world. If you outcast me away from your groups, how can I, do you want me to just crash a party? I can't do that. If I'm outcast away from your groups, I'm outcast. As in, I don't know why I'm, I'm not accepted or he's or she, somebody else is not accepted. We need somebody to come over and say, why don't you come over and have a seat with us? We're all, we're all, uh, we're getting ready to play some cards. Would you like to play some cards? No, I don't play cards because I'm a Christian. Now we got a Christian, right? Well, we have a uh, pastor such and such over there and his wife, or we have um, a single guy over there. He's a bishop. He's single. That's how you do. You you get people. You you bring them together with the people who are in their typical in their typical uh, peer groups. You don't put them down because they don't drink or they don't smoke drugs or they don't eat a lot of this. They don't want to eat this. No, can I just want to have some salad? Are you sure? Because we have plenty of food. We got a great chef over there. Introduce the chef to him. You want to go over there and, and see what else is? Maybe there's something else you might want to eat. You talk to them and encourage them to come to get involved. You don't just bring somebody to your house and see, sit them down and nobody's talking to them. That means you're not a great hostess. I'm a hostess. I know what it's all about. You set people up in environments where, where they're comfortable with other people who are of their type. And if they're not of their race, of their social class, or of their status, or their profession, or their preferences. One is a methodological matter who has access to what's seen and with what, what outcome. Okay? But in addition to the question of access, there is the less frequently examined question of the very building blocks of knowledge, construction, namely, whose questions get raised for investigation. Okay, Tatum questions were raised for investigation because she negatively impacted that environment as the problem is going to occur because a bunch of black kids are sitting down to have lunch at the University of California in one group when everybody else does the same every day. 
Let us examine this matter more closely, for it will lead us to an insight about the study of race. The basic point that my colleague was making was about objectivity. What are your objectives? What are your points of interest? What are your goals? What are your purpose in life? Do you know what you want to do in the next five years? If so, what, how do you think it will help you? These are questions that we poll people during enrollment counseling. I did that a lot. I asked people questions and I tried to get them to talk and they stayed silent and won't tell me anything. And now they're subjective of under my questions and they feel as though I'm interrogating them and they're flipping it to be a negative and now they, I get a, they hang up the phone. Now I gotta call them back and tell them, please, I'm sorry if I said anything to offend you, but please give us a call back within six months if you should change your mind to attend school. And I got a lot of hang up calls. Thus I did at least three enrollments a month for 10 months. So is how, how is it that you're examining the, 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 the situation? Where are your building blocks of knowledge, your construction? You're constructive. You're going to construct something. You're going to build it up. You're going to build in blocks. And like the moms, the new babies, they give them the ABC blocks and their building blocks. They learn that you got the building blocks, but we have the, the alphabets and the numbers on them. And at the same time, it's a learning process for that toddler, that baby. It's not only building blocks, it's a learning process. And you identify with two different aspects of life. Numbers, what you're going to need when you become an adult to ch balance your checkbook and to understand how to count when you're p buying for things you're paying with cash to know make sure you get back the right change and letters so that you'll be able to read and so that you'll be able to write and you'll be able to to study and become a student one day you'll be able to be competitive in society to understand so these are just a building blocks Let us examine this matter more closely for it will lead us to an insight about the study of race and that's the object objectivity and distance and comparative perspective I just gave. He said that he would never study this own he said that he would never study his own group because he would be too committed to the outcome. Now he is um the person that was where in the beginning that I start reading was the African American guy. As we remember we have the African <laughs> excuse me. Remember we have the African American issues, the Latino students issues, and the Asian American issues and concerns about race. So now we're speaking about the African American issues. He said that he would never study his own group because he would be too committed to the outcome. Um, but what is his own group? He certainly studied the behavior of whites in America. And I had just said that um, not long ago. But like the Santa Barbara Lunch Group, Santa Barbara Lunch Group, okay, that's the, the eight black kids at the Santa Barbara Lunch Group. He and his students are just having lunch. And that's on page, well, it's on the forward page. That's 12. It's two eyes. Just have a lunch. What research? He is not studying what he and others would call their whiteness precisely because whiteness is typically an unmarked category. And remember, I did say according to the instructor, Dr. Campbell, that whites did not have an identity. They didn't know where they came from. They were just white people without any pigmentation of color. And some whites that live up in the North Pole in very cold climates with nothing but Alaska and ice, they're very, very white, white, white. And then we have those whites who are in America or Europe, they have some color to their skin. So this guy is saying that white, to him, whites are unmarked category. They're unmarked. Because they, they're not criticize. You get it? They're not pestered. They're not um, interrogated. Thus he could circum is this word? 
circumnavigate the epistemological question of how do we know he was not studying white behavior by the methodological legal domain of not raising that question in the first place. So um, the circumstances, uh, we, we ponder around. The epistemological is the nature of that question of how do we know he was not studying white behavior by the methodological legal domain of not raising that question in the first place. So the, method, the med, methodological ledger domain is like a um, ledger, like the, 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 um, the actual dominion, the actual existence. Issues of assess are sometimes arbitrarily distinguished from matters of content. In the empirical world of social research, that distinction can fade. Some things they just don't tell you in that graduate methods course. One of them is the synergistic feature of race in the single interview versus the group interview. And that's the mechanism, the defense mechanism, the synergistic is the mechanism feature of the, of the, the synthesis of the synergistic is the energy that the, um, the, um, the egos and the, the feature of the race. Your significance or your um, in a single interview versus a group interview. So one of them is a synergistic feature of race in the single interview versus the group interview. So let's look that up. Synergistic. Just make sure I have it correct. Sometimes you don't see words in a long time. So don't be ashamed. Look it up. You, you want to make sure you understand what you're reading. S Y N. Synergism, synergistic. Synergy is synergism. Okay, synergism, interaction of discrete agencies as industrial firms, agents as drugs or conditions such that the total effect is greater than the sum of the individual effects. So I said dominions. You know, the dominions or the authority figures and dominions, different units. But it describes it here and the Merriam-Webster dictionary is our interaction of discrete agencies, agents, agents as drug agents, as drugs, agents as in drugs, drugs, uh, medication, those are agents, they're considered agents because they have different, um, uh, uh, their compilation of strength in the drugs, 500 milligram, 300 milligram, uh, 800 milligram. Usually get that in painkillers. A synergistic is a noun or condition such that the total effect is greater than the sum of the individual effects. Okay, so the total effect, the individual effect, meaning that the total body, everybody, suffers together. The, for, if an individual does something in a group, and if that group the stronger the total body of that group does not fix it, that one individual, and it's what they call one bad apple, will spoil the whole. That one bad apple will spoil the whole bunch. I think Michael Jackson made a song. One bad apple will spoil the whole bunch of girls. Something like that. But anyways, we got a. Uh, The whole group is responsible for the turnout of, 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 of the, the projects that they're researching. Issues of access are sometimes arbitrarily distinguished from matters of content. In the empirical world of social research, that distinction can fade. Some things they just don't tell you in that graduate methods course. One of them is a synergistic feature of race in the single interview versus the group interview. Okay. For several years, I was a principal investigator of a research project investigating how people and families with genetic diseases like cancer deal with those problems in their daily lives. The two most common inherited potentially lethal single gene disorders in the United States are sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis. 
Cystic fibrosis occurs primarily among Americans of North European descent and sickle cell disease occurs primarily among Americans of West African descent. And I wrote a paper on sickle cell disease as well. Um, I am anemic, so I have to make sure that my blood levels are always counted, make sure that my RBCs are, are high and that the white blood cells are also normal because of being an anemic. But sickle cell anemia is, is when you have deformed uh, blood cells. Red blood cells are deformed. In the course of the research, we discovered that when our African-American interviewers made contact and interviewed African-Americans with sickle cell disease or with family members who were carriers of the sickle cell gene, we routinely were better able to penetrate into the various layers of both the immediate and extended families. Why? Because they're black because they're both African-Americans. This in turn provided increased access to a wider range of discussions because they were able to get in and do the story now. They were able to, to because they were trusted because they're of the same skin color, the same race. Okay, that, um, it's not a particular surprising finding. Whereas this in turn provided increased access to a wider range of discussions. They were able to get in this, social inquiry and now ready to talk to people, get answers they were looking for. Um, so that uh, is not a particularly surprising finding to be able to um, go in and perform a social and political interview about the issues that occurred with white interviews. So what they're saying is this in turn provided increased access to a wider range of discussions about social, I'm sorry, and political issues than occurred with white interviewers. So white interviewers could not get in there and talk to black people. That's what they're saying. And now uh, black people need, might have the same problems. And I do recall, as I did my book report, my book notes and reviewed the book, um, that um, I analyzed the book and reviewed it. So it's like, and then I had to report the information that I analyzed to the professor to give my notes on it, book notes, okay? Um, I'm sure black folks who were uh, private research investigators who were black travelers um, had the same problem on the other side of the fence. However, we also conducted group interviews, mainly of members of different families these group members had in common the diagnosis of the genetic disorder somewhere in their families. It was in these settings that we came across a truth about research on matters ratio that is not taught in graduate methods course. Okay, so I think it's one of the reasons why Dr. Jason J. Campbell decided to teach the racism um, American experience because it's, it's, this, this program is, is very, very uh, controversial and many people do not like to talk about race. You know, blacks nor whites, because it, it sends us right back to, to slavery, right back to Holocaust, right back to things that harmed us and that we have traumatic experiences. It was in these group settings that we discovered the powerful salience of race and, and the synergistic feature of discussions about a race-related topic some of the most important concerns and issues never surfaced for exploration with white interviewers because the group being interviewed never headed down the road to frame the question in such a manner in the first place. So when white interviewers came in to discuss and if blacks allowed them in their communities to talk with them about something that has to do with HIV virus or AIDS and you know give their in input on it, um, White interviewers were not getting the whole story because blacks, they closed, they closed down on them, they shut down on them. They gave them little bits and pieces of information. I refer here to what whites would more likely see as a paranoid tendencies on a part of African Americans regarding the medical profession and a government interest in the health of blacks. So whites said that they were paranoid. Uh, white travelers came back said that the black people were paranoid they were, they, their paranoid tendencies because they didn't just, didn't want to give them the whole story. And what, and what it was that black people don't trust. They have a problem trusting people. 
<laughs> they don't care if it's going to help them or not. They're not going to talk. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. And then you're going to feel nervous and like somebody's going to shoot you. And you have to get out of there. <laughs> It's the same way how this black woman started getting loud when we had the white traveler go to Africa and Liberia where they were eating hearts and we had these two military, two men, the rivals, the prime minister. I think the guy was Leroy Johnson and another one I don't know over in Africa and Liberia. And, and um, it was a section where the white traveler and his men with the cameras they went into this small area, excuse me, where there were prostitutes. And when that prostitute start saying, we need money, and let's just start getting loud and everything, they got the hell out of there. Because now she was raising a voice. And, and, and so when you get into a situation like that as a private, invest, a re, private investigator in research, as a social scientist in an, an area whereby there are very a lot of tension and black people or in an area where people have been murdered and, and there's a genocidal happening and atrocities and you go in there now we have the very coops who took over standing way across the field over there with binoculars and they're watching everything and as soon as the white traveler leave what are they going to do they're going to go in there and shoot up and kill everybody that open up their mouth. And so it's, it's one of the main reasons why it's very important in research that participants are understanding that it's, a dangerous, it's dangerous to participate in, in action research. It is. You can get killed. You can get killed. That's a dangerous job. You can get killed doing action research, participation action research. That's because one person Pat had a paranoid tendency, and that's exactly what the white guy was talking about. And he felt, you know, everybody was paranoid because they thought he was the police, I guess, you know, and that's the first thing that black people want to say. Must be the police. Yeah. So y'all said I'm the most hated. I think police Police most hated. Yes, indeed. And they're supposed to protect and serve us, but why everybody hate them? Search me. We need to go back on the reports and find out. Because we're not supposed to hate the police because we need them when somebody beating us up. And when they come out, you're calling them for help. And they're taking other people's sides, I mean. That's questionable. Whereas um, some of the most important concerns and issues never surfaced for exploration with white men viewers. Because the group being interviewed never headed down the road to frame the question in such a manner in the first place, I refer here to what whites would more likely see as a paranoid tendencies on the part of African Americans regarding the medical profession, regarding their health, and the government interests food stamps, and the health of blacks, okay? Um, in each of the four groups in which there was an all-black membership, these paranoid tendencies surfaced and then escalated to a steep spiral as a call and response. Features of commentary and exchange occurred. For example, it was not uncommon for blacks to cite the fact that Puerto Rican women were first practiced on with the birth control pill for several years before the pill was distributed in the country to white women. And birth control pills would make you sterile. Birth control pills messed me up too. I was on birth control pills for seven years from the age of the time, from the age of 16 years old, a time I can get them. I had to get permission from my guardian that raised me. And I, I had became sexually active. I didn't want to get pregnant. Birth control pills would mess you up. By the time I reached 23 um, and, and were married, my first baby, I, I uh, had a tuba pregnancy, and it was because of the birth control pills. So 
So you can't stay on them very long. You have to get off them, stay on them for a couple of years and then switch it around, get, um, try the, the, the uh, they call it the spermatozoid, which is a, a um, it's like a cream because sometimes these men, they don't have condoms, they're too cheap. They may, you know, it's four ninety nine for a pack of condoms, but they never have them. So ladies, you must supply the condoms sometimes if you want to make love to these guys because we have so many diseases going on in, in pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies that end up in abortions. So the Puerto Rican women were first practiced on with the birth control pill before they gave it to the white women. Notions of governmental conspiracy to do research on black women and for biotechnology firms to try to make money by practicing on blacks, not only surfaced in the black groups, but spiraled upwards into a cascade of larger sets of imagery, imaginary or imagery about the government and its role in health research relevant to blacks in America. And you know, many of us um, who are men still are horrified about the Alabama Tuskegee Institute syphilis experiment. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why black men right now today, you can give them a million dollars, seem like they won't go to, go to the doctor and get a checkup. <coughs> They're scared to go for a check -up. Nothing wrong with me, but black men has a high rise in prostate cancer. So um, I recommend that black men should always have a, have a, a they, uh, women has a pap smear. Black men, you have to go in to have a, a, a test that has to do, they take a swab. Why am I forgetting a test? <laughs> Uh, prostate. Uh, men go in for a prostate check. You just go in and, and uh, tell them that you want to get it checked out. I'm sorry, I forgot. It'll come up to me. Sometimes my brain go away and it comes back. Um, but you need a PSA. That's what you call it. I finally got it. A prostate serum analysis. A PSA. And, and, and it helps men to know early if you have cancer cells because prostate cancer is killing many black men the ages of 45 years old and older so the thing is that the thing that is most striking about this research is that this pattern occurred in all the all black groups but never occurred when there was a white interviewer moreover the phenomenon that the phenomenon only barely surfaced when there was a black interviewer in a one-on-one -on -one interview. <clears throat> it did occur in a group setting. And while focus group research acknowledges the special role of the group process in mining certain truths that do not come out in individual interviews, race as a concept is not taught as having this special synergistic feature and getting at a collective version of reality. So people just do not want to talk about it. It's just too many twists and turns and avenues. You got to talk to too many grandmothers and great grands. And you, these grandmothers and, 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 you know, the little small villages, and you see the women sitting out rocking the chair, they know exactly when that man went in that woman's house. And now they're looking on the night month to month what as soon as she pop up pregnant they know exactly who baby it is <laughs> they were sitting on the porch on the rock chair and they're not going to say anything because your husband went to work and that guy sneaked in and now she's sitting on the rocking chair what they call oh miss sally may is so knows that she always over here watching my can't invite none of my friends in here. Then Sally may looking at a at a watch what time he came in and how many times a week he come in. Then you go hear the pastor talk about it in church on Sunday. And that's these <laughs> villages. It's just reality. That's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> and while focus group research acknowledges the special role of the group process 
and mining certain truths that do not come out in individual interviews. Race as a concept is not taught as having this special synergistic feature and, and that's your objectives in getting your objectives between your individual perception and your group perception. A group always overall wins overall an individual perspective. A group is powerful. If you let one person destroy a group, your group deserves to be destroyed. The contributors to this volume are engaged in a process of collective redress of the imbalance of research on race, counterbalancing by increasing our consciousness of ordinary research in which race is embedded because it is unexamined and unexamined because it is embedded. It's like grounded. It's like hidden. Nailed down. And people are just not speaking about it. They, they want to talk about it. We are, you, have to, you may have to ask your grandmother, your great grandmother, um, what is her, what was her family's, what, what was her dad's name, her on her side of the family, because your mother and your grandmother always take your father's or your grandfather's surname. So now you need to know the maternal side of the family. Okay, because we need to know our family members. Because you young girls growing up, you're going to end up having sex with your cousin over there around the corner. Because nobody told you anything. And now you're pregnant for your cousin. Married your cousin. Happens. We are reminded that the goal is not to achieve symmetry. Um, research on white lunch tables is hard to the point but how and why we come to see certain social and political concerns as racialized. And I had answered the question to that is because uh, Beverly Tatum, Tatum um, probably never, you know, she probably has, has never sat around, she probably has never been around black people. She just does not know the behaviors of black people. And she saw that small, narrow thing that, uh, situation as a research project. The notes uh, points to the published by Basic Books New York from where Beverly Tatum received her notes. The clearest, number two, the clearest example of this came when a student whose ancestry could be traced to the Indian subcontinent came up with a research project to study a community in India. My colleague expressed dismay and concern and dismissed this as just one more example of autobiographical sociology, but India has more than 930 million people, more than triple the size of the United States. Okay, so Beverly was able to do it, but another student came along, wanted to do a research on, uh, study the community in India. It was considered expressed you know, my colleague expressed dismay and concern and dismissed this as just one more example and didn't want to, didn't, didn't approve it. Okay, so that concludes a foreword. I'm going to come back and do chapter one. I have some other projects to do, but we're going to get through this book because someone took my notes out of my house. I don't know who. There's only one person that visits me, and I looked at everything. I'm going to keep looking and see can I find it. I, I'm missing um some bullet points about three pages maybe four pages from my book notes and now i need to lock down uh, my material from the university thank you and god bless i hope you enjoyed the video velma bland